Alrighty. Alrighty, so let's open up our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Genesis 4. <clears throat> Genesis 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse number 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought, the fruit, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering had he not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is the topic of dysfunctional families. Dysfunctional families. Anybody smiling already? Look at that. <laughs> dysfunctional families. Now maybe you know someone that's in a dysfunctional family. Maybe you're in a dysfunctional family. But by no means is this topic easy for me to go over. I always thought, and I was, I was always brought up in a dysfunctional family. And you say, well, what is that? That's one that functions disorderly or doesn't function properly. And um, I came from a family that was divorced and, and broken up, uh, a family that got wrecked by drugs, and uh, there was always an element of, of religion within my family. There was always Jesus and God, and, you know, we were supposed to be, we were professing Christians, actually, and um, I was, on, I was on, the, on the way down the wrong road, putting things in my body that I shouldn't put in, and just on a, on a path of darkness, and by the grace of God that He... He called me out of that life and, and regenerated my spirit after I got born again. I'm thankful for that. And um, so I'm not making light of this topic. And, uh, you know, if, if I did think that my family was dysfunctional, at least that I knew that, that my mom and dad, they loved me. I did know that. And uh, at least I wasn't physically abused. And at least I had food on the table. I had a warm bed to sleep in. I had all my bills paid. So, I mean, you know, looking back, you know, I, uh, yeah, it was dysfunctional, but it could have been a lot, lot worse. And um, if you read the Bible, which we're going to do a lot of it this evening, you can't help but to notice that it's filled with dysfunctional families, cover to cover. And um, that's one of the reasons why I know that God wrote this book, is because why would a group of people, the Jews, write about, you know, um, write about how many times that they turned their back on God and how many times they rebelled and disobeyed what God said in... in uh, and take take time out to mention in detail every one of their sins. You know why, why would they paint their people with, with that sort of color? You know what I'm saying? Like we talk. You know, it's all about the Jews, and I'm just all these people that just fell and just were seem horrible, tragic situations. Um, you know, there's a principle to learn that God tells you about man's sins, and He proves a principle that the law of sowing and reaping, God's never that that law is not any respecter of persons at all. It touches upon all men, for that all men have sinned. And um, so if you say, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm in a dysfunctional family, well then, praise God, because I'm sure you're going to relate to a lot of things that we go over here tonight, and we'll be covering a lot of ground in this lesson. And uh, by the time that we're, we're through with this, you know, I, I hope that it will help us and ultimately give us like a, a sense of deep appreciation that we're really not in as bad shape as sometimes we like to think that we're, that we're in, or that we believe that we're in. So uh, this fu functional family number one, we'll call it the Adams family, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Adam, okay, it all started out in perfect paradise until the wife disobeyed God. And uh, since Eve, since Eve's head was missing at the time, which we've been studying a lot of about the, the structure of the household, since Eve's head was missing, Adam, 
then the devil got a hold of her heart. It's, it's commonly said, you know, the, the husband, the man, he's the, head of the, he's the head of the family, but the wife and the woman, she's the heart of the family. You know, a lot of us men, we think it's all in the head, intellectual, factual, uh, observant, and then the woman, you know, got the emotional side and the heart of it. They both complement each other. You need both of them. So Eve's head was missing. The devil got hold of her heart, and Adam's, um, you know, Adam's heart was missing, Eve, so therefore the devil got hold of his head, which Adam's head should have been Christ. And, um, you know, next thing you know, they, they start their first family in sin. First family in the Bible, it started in sin. And, uh, and what happens? Well, we read there, the, the firstborn, you know, look what Eve said, I conceived a man, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Well, that's a little quick to say, don't you think? I've gotten a man from the Lord. That's Cain. She, she thought that that was a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, written in 4,000 B.C. That's a prophecy of the woman's seed. Well, a woman don't got no seed. That's the man got the seed. So that's a prophecy of the virgin birth 4,000 years later. And Eve kind of jumped the gun a little bit. So I got, I got a man from the Lord. And uh, that supposed promised seed knocks his brother's brains out, strangles him, stabs him. But however he does, he kills him. You notice that in that passage here, that two, two times in verse number 8, Cain talked with, his, with Abel, his brother. Then look at the added emphasis. He rose up against Abel, his brother. What do you got to tell me twice for? You already told me one time. Cain talked with his brother. He said it again. The Lord made him emphasis and put mention uh, that that's his brother. You rose up against your brother and you killed him. And uh, what was the root cause of that, of that relationship between the two of them? It was jealousy, envy. And that jealousy and that envy brought about bitterness, and then bitterness turned to anger, and then anger turned to violence. And that pattern, that thing runs clear through today. Um, so the first family that ever showed up on this earth was a family of four people. Four people. I don't know what it's like to be brought up with siblings. I come out just just me. That's just how I was brought in this world. My dad, just me. And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, there's a principle there, obviously, not to envy your brothers or sisters. Don't get jealous about them. And, uh, you know, that, it'll start with something like that. Then, it'll, then, you, then you grow bitterness toward one another. Then next thing you know, then you'll be angry one with another. Then, God forbid, violence ever creeps onto the situation there. Okay? There's a pattern there. And um, we don't know how long it took before Cain slew his brother, uh, but that family ended up with one dead son and one fugitive on the run. The first family <laughs> killed his brother and ran away from town. Said, I'm out of here. I'm a, I'm a fugitive. I'm a vagabond. I'm going to start my own city. He ran out to the cities. And uh, so here you go. You got Adam and Eve. They lost their first home. They were, they were banished from the Garden of Eden, Garden of Paradise. They lost their first, first home, lost their house. <laughs> The, the first kid was of that wicked one. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Cain was of that wicked one. She got that all mixed up. <laughs> she said, she said I've got, I conceived and bear a man. For, I got a man from the Lord. John ends up writing, Cain was of that wicked one. She ends up producing a devil. And uh, the second kid, Abel, got killed by his own brother. Now imagine that. The first family that shows up in the Bible, first family that shows up on earth was a dysfunctional family. All right, now we're going to talk about the next one, Genesis chapter 6. Next family I'd like to talk about is Noah's. Genesis chapter 6. Now let's start at verse number 9. These are the generations of Noah. Now look how this starts off. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Noah was a perfect man. He was just. He was upright. He walked with God. Perfect in his generations. Okay? A lot of speculation on what, you know, what that means. People may say, well, that's Noah's genes were untainted or untampered with the genetics of the fallen angels and things like that. So they're getting into all that. So there may be something to that. But the practical idea of it, Noah was a just man. He was a perfect guy walking with God. All right? God chose him. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, okay, then look at verse, uh, chapter 7, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteousness 
He, he's always singling out Noah for thee. You know, believe on Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved in thy house. And most of the time you end up, you should, how it should work out, the, 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 the best thing is possible is the husband gets saved ends up getting the wife saved. And then the husband and wife end up raising kids that are saved children. And then the whole houses end up saved. Now back in, Noah found grace. Noah was a just, perfect man. For thee have I seen righteousness, righteous, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. He was righteous, okay? Now, real quick, I just want to give you some similarities of Noah and Adam, okay? Well, they were both on the earth after it emerged from water. You can think about that. Remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 2? Waters were upon the face of the deep, okay? And then, and then Noah, obviously, was on the earth after the flood, so they were both on earth after it emerged from water. Both were appointed to be master over creation. Adam had dominion. Noah was to restart the, you know, the whole thing. Both were required to be fruitful and multiply. Both were given that commission and replenish the earth. Um, Adam was placed in a garden to dress it and keep it. And Noah was, was, uh, was a farmer who kept a vineyard. Uh, both fell from God's grace and after partaking of a fruit... Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that fruit, and Noah went out. What happened with him? He ended up partaking of wine, okay, that fruit, <laughs> and ended up uh, both falling from God's grace there, in a sense. Both of them, their sin exposed their nakedness. Noah got drunk, ended up getting naked. Adam ended up falling, and then he realized, man, I'm naked. Exposed their nakedness. Then both of them were covered by another. God ended up covering Adam and Eve with coats of skin. And then it took Japheth and uh, Shem to walk backwards and cover their dad. So both were covered by another. Both had, cursed, uh, both had curses placed on their succeeding generations. There was the mark of Cain, and there was cursed be Canaan. Ain't that something? Then Adam's third son, okay, that'd be Seth, he produced the Messianic line. Trace back Jesus' lineage, comes from the lineage of Seth. That was Adam's third son. You go to Noah. His third son, uh, son is Shem. And once again, there goes the lineage of the Messiah. There goes through the lineage of Christ. So both their third sons would produce would be showed up in the Messianic line. Um, both had major prophecies as a result of their fall. Okay, the result of their fall, Adam was the seed of the woman. That was a big prophecy. And Noah was the destiny of his three sons, which is one of his destinies of his three sons was blessed be the God of Shem. The God of Shem. That's the, the guys where, where you get the word Shemite or Semite. There'd be your Jew and stuff. So um, uh, you can see with those similarities that it's no surprise that they both had family troubles. Now, Noah was a righteous man who walked with God. And it, it, it's, he's such an extreme character in the Bible that it's, he's, he's one of the reasons why we're still on planet Earth because of Noah. Because one man uh, obeyed God at that time. And, uh, and listened to God, and he built the ark, okay? Now, I don't know how much stress that Noah was in at that time, all right? And I don't know. The, he was on that boat for a whole year, okay? He started out in the 600th year, and he, he was on that thing to the 601st year, okay? He's on that boat taking care of them. The animals probably stunk. It was probably horrible. I don't know what his, what his, where his head was at during that time, but I, I can only uh, imagine what my state of mind would have been. And uh, you don't really read much about Noah's wife, okay? And uh, she could have been troubling him the whole time. She could have been troublesome. She couldn't have been not much of a, a help meet or something. Uh, you know, well, why did you quit your job? And, you know, what are you doing? Now you're going crazy. You're out here building this, this boat in the middle of nowhere. You're telling people it's going to rain. they never seen rain before and things like that. And uh, you're going around in the cities and you're preaching to repent and turn from sin. And who knows? She could have been like one, one of those uh, wives. Uh, you know, people think my husband's crazy and, and stuff like that. And, you know, he's, he's been building this boat, this project. He's on some hobby horse building this project for 100 years. <laughs> like, come on, get a, get a life. What are you doing? You, you quit your job. You're, you're in the woods building, you know, on some hobby horse for 100 years. Uh, I don't know. But she could have been like that. It doesn't say much about her. She could have been supportive. I don't We don't really know much. But could you just imagine the state of Noah's family, okay? You know, imagine what, what those in the world said about about Noah, you know, people in the, going in the city, oh, you know, so your dad's Noah, he's that one crazy kook preaching, repent, turn from sin, and he's out there in the woods banging his hammer all night long and just building, just imagine the people, you know, even the, the Noah's children and stuff, 
your dad your dad's crazy you know you guys are all weird and you, you guys are way out in the woods and you're far away from the city and you're completely you know opposite of, of, of what's going on here in the world and stuff like that they probably uh, probably face a lot of persecution from the from the lost world you know his family and um, you know you know preach he was preaching a message of judgments coming you better get right because God's going to send a flood upon uh, upon earth and people probably like what God who's God I don't believe in God remember every man every that the, the, the imagination or thought was only evil continually. They're dealing with wicked men. Next, you know, God sends rain and, and floods the entire world. And uh, Noah and his family spent one year on that boat. Now, I don't know what, what spending one year on that boat and the temptation you'd face after that, but Noah, first thing he did, he ran out and planted a vineyard and got drunk. <laughs> I mean, that guy must have been on under. You know, people say, well, that was the diff you know, the, the planet was different and. You know, there was a there was a, a shell over the earth and stuff, and the, that got broken. The atmosphere changed. I, I understand all that with creationism and things, but he planted a vineyard. The bottom line is he got drunk, okay, and he he got drunk enough to pass out naked. And you say, who 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 was that? He got drunk. He passed out naked. That don't that don't sound like a just and perfect man, Noah. Okay, you can't, can't forget that. When uh you know Noah sinned by going to the bottle. Instead of going to God, that thing still clear run, runs clear through today. Alcoholism could have that, that's the, the biggest cause, the biggest pandemic, biggest killer. You know, alongside texting and driving, be drinking and driving and stuff like that. That's that's horrible. Noah Noah felt that. That wrecked his family when Noah when Noah did that. Noah woke up. He was so mad that he literally cursed the whole lineage of people because he was so mad about his one son. He um, you know I don't know where that's at though. Somewhere in, in uh, one of these chapters here, 8 through 10, you know, Noah woke up and said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. You know, the prophecy, Blessed be the God of Shem. Japheth is going to dwell in the tents of Shem. And then Canaan's going to be a servant of the servants to his brethren. Okay, and, and I believe the thing got all mixed up. I don't know if, um, I don't know if, if Ham was the oldest. Um, was Ham the oldest or he, he was the youngest? Okay, so Ham was the, Japheth was the oldest. All right, so I guess that didn't work with the, um, it wasn't like there was out of, like, you know, it wasn't like he was the elder. Oh, wait, Ham was the oldest. Or he, he was the youngest. Okay, so that didn't work. So that didn't work at all. Uh, that it was like, you know, cursed be Cain and a servant of servants who should he be to his brethren. Because it's almost like, well, if you was the younger brother, you were kind of supposed to serve your elder brothers as it was. But regardless, you could see that uh, that wrecked the family line. The curse came about a whole group of people. And um, you could see that obviously, you know, like we were talking about last week, there's holes in the armor of, of every hero, even like Noah, how that wrecked his family. And, uh, you know, Noah saved the world, but he was just a man. And, um, you know, w w he was just a man, but he still had that old sinful nature to him. And uh, you know, Noah had a great-grandson. You know who his great-grandson was? It was Nimrod. Nimrod, one of the greatest types of antichrist in the entire Bible. Nimrod, the mighty hunter, built a big tower of Babel. Babel. Um, Nimrod, the greatest types of antichrist, that was his, that was his great grandson. So Noah was clearly in a dysfunctional family. Okay. Now next one, let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2. Talk about Abraham's family. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. But before you get to that, we should have read verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, He said, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now that takes big time faith. Ab Abraham, I chose, I, that's the whole thing. He chose one man. And that, that whole, Abraham, that, that produced a whole lineage of truth and the lineage of the Jewish people. Why, you know, why didn't, why didn't he chose any other person on the face of this earth but old faithful Abraham? You know, Jews call him Father Abraham. Um, Abraham no doubt had faith. He, so he stepped out on faith big time. And so you got you in this wilderness, I'm going to make you a blessing. I'm going to create from you a nation of people. But then along his way, his, no doubt his faith, it faltered. A little bit, okay. Well, look at uh, Genesis chapter twenty. Genesis chapter twenty, verse number two. 
Look at this, Genesis chapter 20, verse number 2. And Abram said of Sarah, his wife, okay, she is my sister. He just lied. And Abimelech, king of Ger er, Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And the next thing you know, you read the story, God intervenes and says, that, that man, that woman that you're about to take, he lied. That, that's not a sister, that's his wife. And even back then, before the Ten Commandments, before the moral law was given to Moses, God came, showed that person in a dream, Abimelech in a dream, that's wrong. Okay, you, and, and he had a conscience against that. I would have never, Abimelech, I would have never took that woman to be my wife if I would have known that that was another man's wife. He knew it was wrong to commit adultery. So in the land of Gary, he told his beautiful wife Sarah to pretend to be his sister so that he would be treated well for her sake. Okay? He gave her up to, to be Abimelech's wife, and you know what? He, he ended up receiving cattle and servants in return. Because Abraham lied to him. God was going to pour judgment. And Abimelech said, you pray to God to take this judgment from me. And he did, and he, and he did just that. And, 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 uh, and Abimelech ended up giving him all these servants and, and all that. Okay, from, from something as messed up as that situation, giving his wife over to, an, to another man. And um, look at Genesis chapter uh, 16. Genesis chapter 16. And, it, and with Abraham's troubles, it don't, it don't stop there. At Genesis chapter 16, verses... Uh, one, okay, so, uh, you know, there was a promise seed given to Abraham, I'm going to bless thy seed, okay, and there was a long battle of infertility with Abraham in, in, in Sarah, which, which led to an arranged affair with a slave woman, which ended up, Sarah, look, let's look, let's look at it real quick, Genesis 16, verse number one, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian who was named Hagar. And Sarah said to Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee. Well, what, what's she doing? She should have prayed to the Lord. She's begging her husband. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. He listened to his wife. It was, trying, it was almost like, you know, you go, into my maid, you go into my maid because God failed to provide the promised seed. Once again, they're jumping the gun. They're not, they're not having faith in God and waiting on to see what God would do. They, they took it into their own hands. Abraham ended up listening to his wife and uh, things got uh, in big trouble. Next thing you know, verse number three, Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Agar, her maid, uh, her maid the Egyptian, after Abraham dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, gave her, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And it came in, uh, unto Hagar, and she conceived and look at verse number 5. Sarah said, And my wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom. So what obviously think happened? Jealousy. Okay? And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. And Abraham said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do as it pleaseth with her. When Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled, she fled from her face. What a mess. What a kind of family is that? God told me we're going to have children. We're not having children, so go into my maid. You end up going to my maid. Now I despise her. Now I hate my maid. You get out of here. Kicked her out of the house. We took care of you. You were my servant. You know, we were close. Get out of here. Go fly into the wilderness. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a mess. Sarah got bitter with Agar. And as a result of that, um, look at verse number 12. She produces, a, uh, who, who does she produce? Ishmael, okay? Um. And Paul uses an analogy that Ishmael was born according to the flesh. And then, obviously, Isaac was, was a man of promise, a free man. So there's a picture of bondage, and there's a picture of, um, of the commandments, uh, or uh, of liberty in Isaac. But look at, look at verse number 11. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, thou shalt bear a son, thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord, the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So she produces from that crazy affair, ends up producing a wild man, uh, which, which troubles the Jews, the lineage of Isaac, to this day. To this day, the Muslims, they go back to Ishmael. That's their, that's, they trace back their lineage to Ishmael. Jews trace back their lineage to Isaac. Okay? Um, so, now obviously, throughout the rest of it, you read the rest of it, God's faithful to His promise. And through all the brokenness within that family, He blessed them with the promised seed, Isaac, just according to God's time. 
All right? That's one of the hardest things for anybody in this life is to learn how to wait. Learn how to wait on the Lord instead of trying to take things into our own hands, which we do time and time again. You can make such a big mess of things that you're going to reap what you sow for lifetimes in generations of things. So really be consider your, you know, people are raising, I don't know what's going on with this society, but they're just like, they have no long-term consequences to anything. They're just living in the moment, and they don't want to think anything farther than that. And they're living in the moment, let alone thinking, oh, this is going to have eternal repercussions and eternal judgment. And they're, they're, forget about even thinking about the judgment seat of Christ. That's how far out even Christians are. you gotta, you got to think about the long term and how you're reaping what you sow and things like that. Um, now, the good news, obviously, is God works through broken families. Uh, just because you came from a broken home or a dysfunctional home that... God can and obviously will use someone like that, okay? So you ought, to have, you ought to have faith in Him. You ought to want to seek Him and you ought to want to know Him. All those traits were found in Abraham, those good traits in Abraham, okay? Now here's another one that's associated with Abraham's uh, family. We'll briefly go through this one, uh, Genesis chapter 13. We're talking about Lot's family, okay? This is a little bit before um, all, all that, that scandal went down with Agar, We'll look at Lot's family, which ends up being um, Abraham's uh, nephew. Look at Genesis chapter 13, verse number 9. Now, the first time the word separation shows up gives us a picture of a saved spiritual man, which would be Abraham, separating from a saved carnal man. Remember that Lot pictures in the Bible... Uh, he's, a, he's one of the biggest pictures of all of a backslidden Christian. Lot. Okay, that's, that's the picture of what we learn from Lot's life is he's a backslidden Christian, if you want to use that. Okay, that, that's the principles that we, that we get from studying his life. Genesis 13, verse number 9. Let's read this story real quick. Well, verse number 7. There was a strife. Okay. Remember verse number 7, verse number 8 in the middle of it. Uh, Let there be no strife between me and thee, and between thy herdmen and thy herdmen. We be brethren. Okay, is not, then he says, is not the whole land before thee? And what's he say? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. I mean, that's a basic doctrine of Christian separation. And that first time the law first mentioned that word separate shows up is between family members. Because sometimes family members will be the biggest ones that's going to be hard. It's the hardest things to, to cut ties with. Okay, and, look, and, and sometimes that's a... You know, it has to be out of the right spirit. Uh, you know, Abraham had a humble heart. He wasn't puffed up with pride or nothing. But uh, verse number 10, he, he, he says, look, you, you pick. You take the land. Where, where do you want to go? Uh, and, I'll, and like, like you know, I've talked about this before, but Abraham helped him go. You know, it wasn't like, okay, you get out of here and that's it. But Abraham helped, helped him go. There was some help in that separation. Next thing you know, Lot lifted up his eyes, beheld the plains of Jordan. It was well watered. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the of the Lord, like as the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar, would would Lot get in trouble? His eyes, he seen. Look, man, this is a great land. It got water. Little, little did he know, you know, however long it was, that thing was nothing but a bunch of fire and brimstone. Okay, I believe that city's still around to this day. You go go look at it. It's just a bunch of brimstone still, sulfur. Uh, Genesis. Um, Chapter 13, look at verse number 11. Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, in which is trouble. Pitched his tent toward Sodom. No good. He's going to pitch his tent, you know, I'll just pitch my tent in this direction. You know, you could look out and hear the, the sounds of it and look at it and see the you know, see uh, the, the city lights and how, how pretty things were. And that's what got Lot in trouble. He ended up seeing things, ended up getting him down the wrong path. And then look what happened. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Okay? Um, so there are other things in Lot's life. You could tell that uh, what we're talking about, we're talking about dysfunctional families. And we're going through, we studied Adam and Eve, dysfunctional. Studied Noah's family, dysfunctional. Studied Abraham, dysfunctional. Coming down to Lot, same tale dysfunctional. Uh, what happened with Lot? Well, he moved into that city, pitched his tent towards it, and I'm getting closer to it, moved into it, got close to it, hung out with people around the gates, uh, called them brethren. 
you know, that's something we sometimes we got to watch out for. I know we, we, we're kind of, you know, hey, well, you know, what's up, brother? What's up, brother? And, you know, we're not brothers unless we're brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, even just little lingo like that. Lots, wa lots walking around town calling these men of Sodom who were exceedingly wicked, reprobate Sodomites, calling them brethren. Um, you know, you, so what happens? He, call, he, he loses his testimony in Sodom and Gomorrah. In Sodom and Gomorrah. Next thing you know, he, uh, it takes a supernatural intervention to get his family out of that situation. I mean, that's the only thing it's going to take for, for, for to God to get us out of some situations. There's something got to be supernatural. It took two angels to come down to that city and say, you get out of here right now. You got to go. And I, I don't know, maybe the, the voice of the archangel with the rapture may have to knock over some backslidden Christians over the head and it's going to take some supernatural intervention to wake up. You're about to go. I don't know what the whole... You know, there's a picture of Lot coming out of Sodom just before the wrath, just as there's a picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. God's about to pour out his wrath on earth, but he calls his people out. Okay, so, but it took a supernatural intervention to get them out of that situation. Not only that, when them Sodomites knocked on the door, he said, he said, he called them brethren. And he said, well, and them Sodomites were knocking and saying, look, bring those two men we just seen and let, let us know, we want to know them. They don't want to get down and sit down and get to know each other. And not, no, this was a physical, intimate, sexual way. That's how the Bible talks about it. And you know what Lot did? He gave his two virgin daughters to them, to them sick, reprobate people. A gang of them knocking on the door. Where was Mama at? <laughs> Where was the mother? Wouldn't when, you, when you mothers would have been in there? You ain't giving my daughters away. You're gonna give my virgin daughters away to this gang, this gang of, of reprobate sodomites? <laughs> To do whatever they will. You've seen stories like that in the Bible. In the rest of the Bible, they, they'd end up giving, here, take my daughter, raping her throughout the whole night. She, there, here, there she is, dead on the footstep of the door. I mean, that's crazy. You know, in the book of Judges, I believe, or something like that. Um, you know, where, where was the mother? Where was Lot's wife in that entire story? Once again, where was the help me in, in Lot's? She's not mentioned in that story, except she escaped for a time. And then what happened? What happened to Lot's wife? God turned her to salt. God turned her to salt. And, um, you know, you, you ever, ever wonder why the God turned her into salt? You want to get a little bit of divine irony from God? He turned her into what she should have been the entire time. She should have been salt the entire time while she was in Sodom. With salt. You should be the salt of the earth. You should be a witness. Salt is a picture of a witness. God turned her into what she should have been the entire time. <laughs> salt. I mean, that's like, you talk about divine irony. You should have been sticking up against sodomy. You should have been sticking up. How dare you? T that father is about to give away his two virgins. Where was you at? Where was you at during the whole time? Where you, you were not to be found. Who knows what that mother was doing, you know? Uh, God turned her into she should have been a witness in, in Sodom and Gomorrah the entire time, even if she was living in the city. So she looked back. And got turned into a pillar of salt. And that's the only thing, only thing that that woman's known for in the Bible. Jesus Christ said, you better remember Lot's wife. Remember her wife. And uh, so that, that's a, a whole message within itself. But, um, you know, and if that all didn't sound bad already, this is Lot's family. After they escaped, Lot's, Lot's two daughters got them drunk and laid down with their own father. Where do you think they got that practice from? Living in Sodom and Gomorrah bunch of God-forsaken, wicked, reprobate, sexually minded and stuff. Intimate. What are you doing with this uh, incest? What, what, are you, what are you doing? Getting drunk and laying with your own father to reproduce a seed. Um, you know, and, and they birthed, from that situation, they birthed two of the most known enemies throughout all the nation of Israel, Ammon and Moab. You talk about a dysfunctional family. I don't, we, we think, well, I come from a dysfunctional family. You think you're in a dysfunctional family. You got anything like that? We've got nothing on those situations there. And uh, what I am glad about is I'm glad that after Calvary, all those sins of the Old Testament, them Old Testament saints, they're never brought up again. Ain't that something? Because that shows you that it, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. It took the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You know what Lot's called in the Bible in the book of Peter? Just and righteous Lot. Wow, just and righteous Lot. Ain't that something? So the only possible explanation for that is, is once they got down to Abraham's bosom, the Lamb of God came down. Their sins of the Old Testament, you open up in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, 
By faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham did that. By faith, you know, all these things. And we're, we're studying the negative sides of them. None of those things are mentioned. They're gone. They're wiped away. That Forgetting those things which are behind, that stuff's gone, taken away from under the blood of, of, of Christ. You know, the promised lamb that God told Abraham he would provide, only obviously that blood of the lamb can take away all those sins, never to be, re never to be remembered of, completely taken away. But that's a mess. That's a mess. Now let's look at uh, let's look at Genesis chapter twenty-five. The next family we'll study Isaac's family. Now briefly, the brokenness continued in Isaac's family system. He married Rebecca and had two sons together, Esau and Jacob. All right, and Esau, you know, big man's man, hairy chest, and 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 toting his, his hunting and his bow and arrow and stuff, and big big game chasing kind of man. And then you got Jacob, kind of, you know, smooth skin and and hanging out in the kitchen. You know, always portrayed as like, he's mama's boy and things like that. And uh, Genesis chapter twenty five, verse twenty seven. Look at the the trouble. Genesis twenty five, verse twenty seven. So here's the trouble within this family. Genesis twenty five, twenty seven. Um, and the boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Esau, a big man's man, going out hunting and things like that. You know, his dad loved him. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Maybe they had a connection. Jacob's always hanging out with me. He's in the kitchen. I'm baking him cookies and stuff. You know, we're, we're good. We have a good relationship, whatever. But what kind of wrecked this family is that element of, of favoritism. Okay? And, and uh, I don't know much about, about parenting yet. I don't know. I don't got much to speak on that. I ain't an authority to, to speak on it yet. I don't got no children. So I don't know what it's like to, with the temptation of choosing favorites within a family and how, you know, how that may, um, may affect things and how, you know, divided, uh, you know, parental affection or whatever, that could, that could tear apart a family. And, um, you know, you imagine just the little comments among the family. You know, Isaac praising Esau. You know, uh, you know, real man's man. You got me, yeah, we, we, we got out hunting and things like that. I mean, I love Isaac. You know, he's, he gets me all this venison. And Jacob, he's over there. What's he doing, you know? And, and, and then they're both, try, both bickering and Rebecca trying to stick up for Jacob. And, oh, he's my baby. And, he, I, you know, I love him. And he's a... He's a good guy. He's a man at heart and things. And just imagine the conversation going around in, within, the, within that house and that Isaac always showing special favor to Esau and Rebekah always showing special favor to, uh, to, to Jacob. Okay? And um, they're always trying to, to they're always like battling all the, in the house and stuff. And so then one day Jacob, I think his name means supplanter, uh, Jacob swindled Esau out of his brother's birthright by lying to his dad with the help of his mother, Rebecca. Okay? And um, you talk about division right there. I mean, look, you know, you're going to get the blessing and you're going to, you know, you're going to inherit this from your dad. So I'm going to, that, that older brother, forget about your older brother Esau. He don't deserve it. You deserve it. So we're going to trick old, old dad and we're going to send him in there, you know, put hairy arms. The mother was involved in it. Cons like conspiring type, type of thing. And, uh, so, so, so under, Esau, understandably, then wanted to kill his brother because you just swindled me out of my birthright. And so you know, I can understand why Esau wanted to, wanted to kill his brother. And Jacob ran away. He went to go live out with Uncle Laban, who's a crazy guy. Uncle Laban, you want to marry one of my daughters? Here, I'll give you, I'll give you the ugly one, Leah. You worked for me for seven years. You take the ugly one. Leah was fair-eyed was, was, was fair or whatever like that. She had good eyes, but Rebecca was beautiful. It worked for seven years, Uncle Laban. Here, take the ugly one. And then, and then to smooth things over, okay, here, take the beautiful one now. Then he gets Rebecca. So right then there's some trouble going on. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the dysfunctional stuff doesn't stop there. You know, they, they get in trouble with, with Laban. They flee out, and Laban's accusing them, you stole my gods and stuff. What in the world's going on? <laughs> you know, they were gotten a mess from, from that whole situation. Um, you talk about dysfunctional. So Jacob... All right, now he had a messed up family. Jacob, Genesis chapter 29, verse 30. Genesis 20, I mean, we, we ain't even out of the first book of the Bible, and we're, we're in a bunch of dysfunctional families. I mean, we gotta be, you know, we gotta be able to relate to, to some of these things. Maybe this is extreme. 
So that's what I'm saying. I'm hoping so some of this is when we go over these, that we look and think, man, I mean, I'm going through nothing. I mean, my, my mom and dad, they never gave me up to no crazy people. And my dad ain't, ain't getting drunk and, and cursing my entire generation of people. Or I mean, you know, we, we, got, it, we got it made. Uh, Genesis chapter 29, verse number 30. Genesis chapter 29. Look at this one, verse number 30. Uh, and he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven years. God never approved of that type of stuff. Look, you're going to have two wives. <laughs> How do you think that's going to get along? You can barely make, make one happy, let alone try to make two happy? I mean, wait till we get to Solomon's family. <laughs> let alone try to make 700 of them happy? <laughs> How do you think that's going to fare out? But he loved, he loved Rachel more than he loved loved Leah, okay? So that thing, that, that, that's, that's no good. Jacob's family was all divided up. Now, should we go into the rivalry of the siblings, okay? Jake, Rebecca, uh, where was it? Rachel and Leah, they give birth to the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, Jacob, Israel. 12 tribes of Israel. These tribes get all split up. I mean, that's why God, even when he designs the, the tabernacle and the heart of it, which is cool because there's the tabernacle, you know, the camp, and then there's the two tribes up here, two tribes over here, two tribes over there, I think four tribes down here or whatever. So it adds up when you go on a bird's eye view, you look down and see a cross, which is pretty cool. You see the, the Ark of the Covenant and all that and the heart of it, but their camps are all spread out in that pattern. They all divided up. You know, there was no even intermingling amongst the tribes. Their whole, their whole siblings got all split up. Genesis chapter 37, verse number 1. Genesis 37. Verse number, uh, yeah, let's come back. Yeah, verse number one. Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Genesis 37. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, he's feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age. He made him a coat of many colors. Okay? So Jacob, uh, he, loved, he loved Joseph. He ended up going, it's like a dad buying his, but his, his, his favorite son. I'm going to buy the, the greatest designer coat of all time. <laughs> you know, pick a designer or whatever. I got you this fancy designer coat and I made it for you. How do you think that fared well with the rest of the, with the, rest of the siblings? You got him this nice flashy designer coat, all these colors in it. And we, you never done nothing like that for me. You know, what, what, what's the deal? Uh, so that didn't sit well with the brothers. And this is wild. Instead of just leaving poor little Joseph, little, teen, little teenage boy, instead of leaving him out of the family football game or something like that, they conspired and said, we're going to throw our brother into a pit. We hate him. Then we're going to lie to dad and tell him, look, an animal came and killed him. And then one of the other, Judah, the, the, one of the other little brothers, he, he was supposed to be most reasonable, he came in and said, look, we can't do that. Let's just sell him into a, 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 a gang of Egyptian thugs and just we'll sell him into there and then, and then we'll come back and take the coat and say, look, Dad, look, an animal killed him. We can't just throw him in the pit and leave him. Uh, you know, geez, oh, man, that's crazy. Uh, you know, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm sure maybe some of you thought that, hey, I'm going to throw my sibling in a pit and I'm going to leave him there for dead. I don't know if any of you guys ever thought of that before, huh? But that's extreme. That's real extreme. Then to sell them into slavery, you know. So I, I believe that it, it just goes down the line. And, we're, and then, then it's in Jacob's, you know, Jacob and Esau and, and, and Abraham and, and, now, and now the 12 tribes and the, the division amongst all of them. Uh, you know, Joseph forsaken by his brethren. Maybe the principal there is don't have 11 boys. <laughs> Maybe there wouldn't be so much bicker and arguing. I don't know. But uh, look, at, look, at, uh, look at Exodus. We're getting in the next book, Exodus. Exodus, let's just go run down to Numbers. I come down, I go to Numbers. But the story is, the next guy is Moses, okay? Moses. He started out his life by being shipped down a river and adopted into the family of Pharaoh, okay? His family, were, his, uh, his family that he came from, they were slaves to Pharaoh and ended up, he was being adopted into that family system. Pharaoh ended up taking them and things. And, uh, and, and he was raised in Egypt and then he grew up and learned that his whole entire life was a lie. I mean, you talk about scarring. 
wake up one day, look, we're, we're really, you know, I'm not really your dad or mom. You imagine if you woke up that your dad and mom are over there and they're a bunch of slave people over there and servants. And, and Moses, man, that, that kindled a fire in Moses. And then what happened to Moses? Next thing you know, he went up, you know, end up killing the Egyptian and fleeing out in the wilderness for 40 years, okay? Then what happened? He started a family. He married a Cushite woman, also known as an Ethiopian. Look at, uh, look at Numbers, Numbers chapter 12. Moses, he had some siblings. Look at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. I mean, we're talking about godly men here. You know, we're, we're t I mean, it, Moses, Abraham, Noah, Adam, I mean, in, in, in the trouble, it just, it's just, none of us are, are, are uh, exempt from, from this stuff. And God shows us this. And that's why I always say, I try to encourage you all. If you're going through something in your life, you're going through family troubles, you're going through things, you got to seek God's word for counsel. And God will show you some things. Anything that you're going through in life, you ought to, you ought to see what God says about it. Numbers chapter 12, look at verse number 1. And Miriam and Aaron, that's his family, that's his sister and brother, spake against Moses because of the, uh, the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. I mean, they were like, what are you thinking? You know, you, I mean, geez, you talk about racism. You, you married an Ethiopian woman. Well, this, these aren't your people. People hold, hold serious to that stuff, you know, with, with their customs and cultures and stuff. And look what happened. And hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses, and hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now, like this. Now, the man Moses was very meek, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He didn't just lose his cool right away and flip out and things like that. But Moses did flip out a couple times. Well, what does it take for a man that was the meekest in all the earth to lose his temper? A group of, of stubborn, stiff-necked, um, complaining people. He smote the rock twice. Meekest man in the earth. He got a little anger. He got a temper. Lost his temper ever, <laughs> so often. That's a meek man, though, Moses. Then verse 4. The Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye, out ye three out of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the three came out. The Lord came down the pillar of the cloud, stood in the door. Called Aaron and Miriam. They both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision that will speak unto him. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. In the uh, silence of the, uh, in the similitude of the Lord, shall he behold. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You're talking about his wife. You're speaking, you, and you're, you're trying to, oh, isn't God speaking to us too? No, he's not. God said, I'm speaking to Moses only. You want to talk about his wife like that? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Next thing you know, a cloud come up, shows up. Miriam, his sister, gets smoked with leprosy. You don't dare speak about a man of God like that. You get smoked with leprosy talking about his wife. <laughs> I mean, that's a, you talk about trouble. Uh, so his sister gets st stricken with leprosy for talking bad about her brother. And, uh, and she ends up... Ends up um, I uh, believe ends up getting right. Well, look at verse number 15. Miriam was shut up out of the camp for seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. Uh, so she had to learn a lesson. And so that was a long thing to say about there to come, coming against his wife like that. And then number, uh, the next one, while we're talking about Moses' family, we'll, we'll make another one, talk about Aaron. There goes his brother. Uh, let's see, uh, number 16. So Aaron... Just a brief thing about Aaron's life and, and his relationship with his brother. Aaron was like the spokesperson, doing a lot of the miracles that that you know to get God's people out of Egypt and things like that. And uh, you know Mo Moses goes up on the mountaintop to talk to the Lord, and then then back down there down at the camp, they had Aaron. All the people here, give me all your gold and all this stuff, and 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 cast it into the fire. We're going to make a golden calf out of it. Aaron's completely undoing everything that God told them, called them out of, you know, that, that, that lifestyle. Aaron's undoing all that and saying, well, no, we're going to build this calf. And uh, so Moses is up there talking to God. Aaron's down there completely backslidden, messing up the whole entire thing. And um, it displeased God, okay? And, you know, Moses comes down, you know, hot. He, the Lord's like, my, my anger is waxing hot 
against these people. I'm about to smite them. And Moses acts as an intercessor and says, look, Lord, you, you can't do that. So Moses was a good man. If you're going to smite them, you might as well smite me. And that's a bad look. That's a bad look on you, Lord, because you called us out. Ain't nobody reason with the Lord like Moses could. I mean, he changed the Lord's mind. <laughs> I mean, talk, that's amazing. Um, that, that defeats that whole thing of Calvinism, of predetermined, um, what's it, eternal decrees. How God eternally decreed how things should be before the foundation of the world. My God changed his mind multiple times. You got Moses to change his mind. Now, anyways, with Aaron, um, so this is still within the family of Moses, let's say his nephews, Aaron's sons. Look at number 16, verse 24. Look what happened to Aaron's sons. Talking about dysfunctional families. Look at Numbers chapter 16, verse number 25. Well, verse number two, 24. Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses arose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders that followed him. And uh, so they got up. Uh, come to verse number 33. We'll get to the, get to the point of it. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from the congregation. They offered strange fire before the Lord. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's bad stuff. You would think that a, that a high priest, Aaron, the, you talk about a preacher, a pastor, a minister, you would think he'd be able to raise two kids that would end up, yeah, you know, that's how it usually works. Pastors end up the dads, and then the, then the dads kind of force the kids into the ministry, and they don't really amount to nothing. They weren't really called to preach or nothing. Daddy just forced them to get into the ministry and stuff. But you would think that Aaron would raise up two young, young priests. What happened to them? They fell to apostasy and offered up a strange fire. They end up getting killed. Now, and, and that, the whole, why, you know, then the whole people got, why would the Lord kill them? Questioning God like that? And God swallowed them up in the pit too. You want to side with them? Well, I'll, I'll swallow you up also. I mean, that was the mentality. Now, uh, next one, let's go, 1 Samuel. So there's, there, there goes Moses' family, and there goes his brother and his brother's family. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next one. Let's look at 1 Samuel, chapter 18. Next one would be King Saul. Okay, King Saul. Um, 1 Samuel 18, 9. So the family trouble with King Saul would be between him and David and even Saul's son, Jonathan. Okay? Um, so is, this is Israel's first king. He was people's choice. That's what people's choice will get you. He wasn't God's king. David was God's king. But he, God said, look, you want people's choice? We, people said, we want a king, we want a king. They picked Saul. Now, it wasn't right. So Saul, he was, he was jealous of the, you know, of the popularity of a little shepherd boy, little David. And, uh, he, and throughout this whole book, he becomes obsessed with trying to kill David. Okay? It starts off, and, you know, number one, who, who killed Goliath? David did. Who was the only one that possibly could have stand a chance to kill Goliath? Saul, tallest of them all. You know, he, he should have been out there killing Goliath. He sent little David out, and... And, uh, and David, David killed him. In uh, Samuel 18, 9. Well, you know, well, yeah, Saul, uh, let's go back. The, the jealousy of Saul. Look at 18, verse 6. Came to pass that came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the woman came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets and joy, with insurance, music. The woman answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. You imagine hearing that song and you're the king? That got him mad, okay? Saul was very wroth. And the saying displeased him. And said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands. And to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he, what can he have more but the kingdom? What's he going to have? He's going to have the kingdom now? Which, yeah, he ends up getting it. So Saul eyed David from that day forward, okay? He became, he, we're gonna, you know, you see some, some stuff there. Um, next, so what was the reward that, that, that David got? He got, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Michelle, Michal, M-I-C-H-A-L, his daughter. I always say Michelle. That just sounds more, like maybe that's an Americanized of it, whatever. But he gave his daughter, Michelle, to David. Okay, good job, David. You killed Goliath. Now here's my daughter. Okay, here's, here's Michelle. Um, now that's David's father-in-law now, Okay. You talk about a, you talk about a, uh, what is the word? 
bipolar father-in-law. <laughs> One time, David's in the palace. They're all sitting down feasting. And, and, and David, he was a skilled musician. He wrote psalms, wrote songs, you know. David's playing, uh, playing the harp. And da David's soothing Saul. And it says the evil spirit departed from Saul when David's playing his beautiful harp and things like that. And next thing you know, Saul, and then Saul just does a 180 and he takes a javelin and throws it out the wall at David. <laughs> and David flees and escapes. And that man had enough guts to come back and play the harp for him again. <laughs> you, try, you talk about trying to patch things up in honor to the king of Israel at that time. You know, that guy was crazy, Saul. And, you know, trying to, trying to kill him. And finally David had enough. And, uh, and let's look at 1 Samuel uh, 16, 23 here. 1 Samuel 16. Well, here. I'm, I might be 20, actually. 1 Samuel 16, 23. Yeah, no, it's, it's 20. Go to 20. 1 Samuel 20, 13. So then there's some division among Jonathan, Saul's son, with... Uh, we, you know, with his dad, okay? Because Jonathan, they, they loved David. They would t you talk about best friends. There's no best friend friendship in this Bible than there is with Jonathan and David, okay? So 1 Samuel 20, verse uh, 12, 20, 12, Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow any time or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and then I send not unto thee and show it, and show it thee. The Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee, and send thee away. Meaning, get out of here, David. That thou mayest go in peace, and the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with my father. And thou shalt not only, and, and thou shalt not only while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not. Jonathan, verse 16, Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even acquire it, at the hand of David's enemies. Um, and Jonathan, caught, verse 17, Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. So then you got Jonathan. Um, you know, the dad and son became estranged, in a sense. Because the dad was super mad and jealous over David. But the son, his son, you know, they were best friends. You're not know, getting my best friend killed. And he told David, you got to go. You got to get out of here. So no doubt there was some dysfunction within, uh, within that family. Now the next one, Second Samuel. Second Samuel. Second Samuel. Verse number chapter number six. Now we gotta talk about David. Second Samuel chapter number six. David, a man's after God, God's own heart. And once again, um, David had a uh, had some serious family troubles. Look at Second Samuel chapter six, verse number sixteen. Um, it starts off like this: and, and the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michal, Saul's daughter, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. There goes marriage trouble. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it before the tabernacle. In the midst of the tabernacle, David had pitched for the burnt offering. Verse 18. And as soon as David had made an end of the offering and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as the, as well as the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flag and a wine. So all the people departed everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. He blessed the people. And then he blessed his house. Okay? And Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncover himself. I mean, I, I could see some, some fair statement in that. A little jealousy. What's my husband dancing out there in a loincloth for in front of all these women? King, King David dancing like that? You know, I could see where she got a little bit bitter about that thing. And David said unto Michelle, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father. Man, you talk about some salt in the wound there. He chose me before your father. 
and before all his house to appoint me ruler of the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will be yet more vile than thus, and will be base in my own sight, and of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. I, 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 my, them, your maid servants will honor me more than you do. That's some bickering and family trouble going on there in the marriage. Therefore, Michelle, the daughter of Saul, had no child under the day of death. So she ended up getting, she ended up getting in trouble. <laughs> Once again, for messing with, with King David. I mean, man, I don't know how that thing works, man. God got a special protection upon his men or something. But you can see some fair grounds on, on how, you know, Michelle or whatever uh, could, felt some type of way. But she ended up getting cursed with no children. After that, that's a sign of, a sign of judgment there because she despised her husband there. Now, that's something. Now, then, uh, after Michelle, David ends up getting in trouble. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Then, after Michelle, he ends up getting in trouble with his neighbor's wife. One of the main top ten commandments. And uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. He broke that commandment, no doubt. Look what, he, look what happens here in 2 Samuel. You would think one that would be easy to keep. Look what gets him in trouble. 2 Samuel 11. Came to pass after the year expired at the time, at the time when kings go forth to battle. He should have been in battle. This is the time when kings are to go forth to battle. That David sent Joab and his servants with him. In all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon. Remember the Ammonites? Ammon, back from Lot. You know, Lot's incestuous thing going on there. Wrecks havoc throughout the whole Israel. And besieged Rabbi. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. No good. He's loafing around. Should have been out in battle. He's loafing. And it come to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed. That tells me he's alone. This guy's alone. What's going uh, Loneliness is no good. It, I mean, you've you, you got to be accountable to people. you got you got to have a routine. you got to be around people. Well, with the old idle mind, the devil's workshop and all that stuff, loneliness got this guy in big, big trouble. Watch out for being alone. It's not good for a man to be alone, as the Bible even says. David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. There it goes again with the, with the look. David sent and inquired after the woman. All right, we read the whole story. Next thing you know, he ends up getting Bathsheba to be his wife. Okay? And it didn't stop there. She ends up getting becoming with child. Next thing you know, to cover that whole scandal up, go tell your husband to go into battle, get some killed. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel eleven fifteen, the Lord said, Thou killed Uriah. David, you killed him. You sent him to battle. So it doesn't mean that David, you know, God charges murder to a man that gets a man killed. You don't have to physically do it, but he gets him killed. That murder gets ascribed to David, okay? And um, now 2 Samuel chapter 12, because, uh, because of that scandal, David ends up losing his firstborn son. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 10. Um, verse number 14, 12, 14. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies to blaspheme. Yeah, you did. You're supposed to be a Jew. You're supposed to not covet thy neighbor's wife, not to commit adultery. You got laws. We know your people. You kill people for adultery. You kill people for committing murder. And you, caught, you gave a reproach to king of Israel. Supposed to be the king upholding the law of judgment, just, and righteousness. You're, bringing, you're, you're causing these people to blaspheme God. What a mess. You give an occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David loses his first kid because of that sin right there. Now, I ain't going to go through this whole thing, but 2 Samuel 13... 2 Samuel 13 to uh, 15, 3. Uh, look, at, look at verse number, th th uh, chapter 13. Verse number 1. It came to pass after this that Absalom was the son of David, 
had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so vexed he fell sick for his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin. Amnon thought for it to, to do anything to her. Amnon ends up laying his hands on her and raping his own sister. This, the, the, David's family just completely goes to pieces throughout these chapters. Um, his sister you know, the, the, the ends, up, ends up getting raped. Next thing you know, uh, um, Absalom uh, wants to kill Ammon for that. Now, once again, there's some downfalls with, with David going on. And um, for raping an unbetrothed virgin, Amnon could have been forced to pay a bride a bride price in Mary Tamar, Exodus chapter 22. There were some rolls and stuff like that with all that. But however, within the king's own household, payment of the bride, it would mean, it would mean nothing. Okay? Um, in, in addition to that, David, well, the point is that David shows respect of persons when it comes to the law. He's not fulfilling the law in, with, 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 on how to deal with a situation like that. And he didn't want, uh, you know, that he was supposed to be the, the next guy in line for the throne and things. Um, he didn't want that to be, to be tainted and, and, and really brought that up. David was mad, but aside from that, he didn't do anything about that situation. I mean, that's like, what, what, what's going on, David? What, you know, what happened there? Um, what David could have done and probably should have done would have been to formally remove Amnon uh, from the succession of kingship. He should have publicly did something like that. But like I said, above beyond just being angry, he never done anything about it. So he kind of lost his moral authority and his righteous authority in judging that matter. Probably because of what happened with him and Bathsheba. He's like, I got... I mean, I messed up too, and probably no room to talk. I mean, there's some, some highs and lows though with, with going on to that. And you know, how can I judge my own son for his sexual sins, and and you know, not not fairly judge mine, my own? I mean, so there was some trouble going on there. And uh, the lesson, obviously, there with the parents is you parents don't lose your moral authority. I mean, that's an old saying. You better, you're going to preach to him. You better walk the walk, and 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 not just talk the talk. I mean, they they look at you and things like that, and uh, you got to uphold that. And obviously, that whole thing, man, them, the, uh, those sexual sins, they wreck a family. From adultery, to fornication, to incest, to molestation, to rep, uh, to, to rape. All those carry a judgment that goes on for generations. So Absalom, he hates his brother, um, ends, up, ends up getting him killed. Then, uh, then Absalom, Absalom flees from the land and, and undermines his father's judgment. Absalom got bitter toward it. Flees the land, says, my dad ain't fit to be king. He ain't judging at all. I got to be king. Gets a whole group of following after him. Absalom conspires against his own dad. Wants to kill his own dad. And I believe one of the, one of the, the verses in there about God's judgment was, uh, the Lord said, the sword will not depart from your family because of what you've done, David. The sword's going to be in your family. And it sure was. And um, God used Absalom when it came to the judgment of David's sin. Ain't that wild, though? You know, we know Absalom. He's the greatest type, one of the greatest types of antichrist in the Bible also. But he used them to judge David's sin. And, um, you know, so that, there's some things there about God's judgment. It's inevitable. And uh, there's learned behaviors. Now, briefly, we're going to just go, go through just a couple more here. Solomon. All right, 1 Kings 4. 1 Kings chapter 4. Obviously, the parents' most important ministry is to raise your children in the Lord by being a good godly example. That's, uh, that's one of your greatest ministries, is to raise your children the best that you can. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see some things here in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse number 29. 1 Kings four twenty nine. Next guy we're talking about is Solomon's family. And if you know Solomon, he's the son of David. He's the son of Bathsheba. So this is David and Bathsheba. And here's their kid, Solomon. God gave Solomon wisdom, verse 29, in understanding exceeding much the largeness of heart even as the sand is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan, the Ezraite, and Heman, and Calco, and Darda, and the sons of Maho, and his fame was, was in all the nations round about. He spake 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. 
a thousand and five songs. Moses, he, Mozart, Mozart wrote six hundred songs. Bach wrote a thousand. Beethoven wrote two hundred and forty. And Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs. That's a lot of songs, man. That guy was a genius. Wisdom. Wisest man in all the world. So surely you'd, be, you'd think that he'd be able to raise a nice and normal family, wouldn't you? Think that? <laughs> Wise men all there, surely he'd be able to do it, huh? Now from a distance, it'd be easy to, to idolize Solomon. The Bible talks about his achievements, building a temple. And it talks about he's building this nice house. Then it talks about he got all these horses and camels. And it talks about all this wealth that he got, and gold and silver, and he's eating golden spoons. I mean, guys, I mean, from a far distance, you'd be like, man, this guy got it all. He got it made. Solomon, the greatest guy that ever walked the earth. But a closer look, Solomon had a difficult life. That guy had a troubled family. And he almost, you know, he kind of had his roots in, in his father's darker side, so to say. Solomon. The, the child from Bathsheba, that, that whole situation. Um, you know, you imagine, all, imagine all that. So Solomon, he came, he came to the throne in the middle of, of family troubles. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse number 15. 1 Kings 1, 15. 1 Kings 1, 15. Bathsheba went in under the king, into the chamber. All right, David, he's getting old, very old. And Ashbag the Shumanite ministered unto the king. Bathsheba bowed and did obstinance to the king and said, King, what wouldst thou? And he goes, goes on with that whole thing. Look at verse number uh, 20. Um, and thou, my lord, O king of the eyes of Israel, upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord after the king. Otherwise it shall come to pass when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. So it pretty much comes down to Bathsheba intervened and reminded the king, David, that my son Solomon is going to be next on the throne. Okay? Um, Absalom, he's dead. Amnon, he's dead. Solomon's next up. He's getting on a throne, okay? So um, Solomon gets on a throne. And um, in First Chronicles, chapter 22, First Chronicles 22, hang with me for a little bit more. more. First Chronicles 22, look at verse number 9. First Chronicles 22, 9. That's why I want to go through these. I don't know how familiar you guys are doing your Bible reading and stuff like that. You know, you're... you're Get your own reading plan. I don't know if you guys are reading Chronicles and Kings and things. So we've got to take this time to go through them. First Chronicles 22. Um, let's see, verse number 9. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give him peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son. I will be his father. I will establish the throne of his kingdom of Israel forever. Okay, there, there goes uh, Solomon becoming king. Now, um, I should have kept you guys in 1 Kings. Go to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. So let's look at a little bit of the downfalls. Okay, So Solomon, he, he gets the throne, which we just read. Then 1 Kings chapter 3. It's almost like an effort to you know, encourage relationships with the other people around Israel. Well, what does he do? Well, look at 1 Kings chapter 3. 3, verse number 1. First Kings 3, 1. Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her in the city of David until he had built an end of building his house in the house of the Lord in the wall of Jerusalem. All right, and it don't stop there. Come to uh, 1 Kings 11. He took, a, he took an Egyptian wife. And look what happens with Solomon's heart. It gets carried away. 1 Kings 11. Look at verse number one. Starts off with just one one worldly woman. Don't you young people don't get a, don't try looking for a woman in Egypt. I'm talking like Egypt is a picture of the world and things like that. Don't try looking for some worldly woman. It'll wreck you. It'll 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 make you get even worse and worse and worse. Looking in the wrong areas. You know that's not where to find them. Don't find them in the world. That's no good. Look at First Kings eleven. Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, woman of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites, and all these people in the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them. 
that principle kind of runs clear through the Pauline epistles. Don't be, une don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay? Neither shall they come into you, for surely they will, for surely, look what happens. You say, no, that's not going to happen. I could withstand it. I'm going to convert her. I'm going to go find me a, a woman in college or a woman, a secular woman or a worldly woman, and I'm going to convert her and win her to the Lord. I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> okay? I wouldn't count on it. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. It might not be Ashtoreth and Moab and Chemosh and all these, but it might be money and sex and, 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 and just take me out and wine and dine and all this and just all this worldly stuff. They're turning away your heart and serve their idols and stuff like that. They're turning away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. It's like every woman he saw, I'm in love with her. I'm in love with her. I'm in love with her. <laughs> I mean, God, and then it goes on. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines. Those are lower class wives. And his wives turned away his heart. You talk about trouble. I mean, you can't have a thousand wives and not have family trouble. Okay, so that, I mean, that's about, that's a, that, that all needs to, to really be said. Now, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, all right, now, some of the other troubles in here, I'm going to try wrapping this up, we're just going to kind of fly through it here. God gave Solomon over to the desire of his hearts. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Paul, or, um, uh, Solomon goes and says, look, I set my heart to know wisdom. I set my heart to do anything that the world had to offer. I got drunk, I had wives, I had materials, I had houses, I, did, I built things, I got accomplishment after accomplishment after accomplishment. People say, man, I, I lived in the world, I lived in the dark, you know. Nobody lived in the world like Solomon did. I mean, he blew out every, he did everything, he set his heart to learn and know madness and folly. He, learned, he, he was a smart guy, I mean, I believe I did I knew science, chemistry, and, I, and he, he didn't just have the book smarts, he was street smart. He had all of it, Solomon. And one, the last verse, the conclusion of, of Solomon, the wisest man on earth, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon comes down to a couple conclusions in his life that we ought to listen to, if you care anything about wisdom, and from a wise man, okay? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep the commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He came down in his life the last thing. Everything's vanity. All is vanity. All, everything I'm doing is vanity. At the end of my day, the whole conclusion is you better fear God, keep his commandments. Because I didn't do those things, I wrecked my life. I mean, I, I mean he, you know, Paul, uh, I keep saying Paul. Solomon, he, um, he, he came to that conclusion about everything that he did in his life. Now, next thing you know, 1 Kings 11, 43. Um, well, here, Proverbs 22, verse 6. Here's the famous verse. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. Sometimes, uh, 22, verse 6. You know, sometimes parents get discouraged, though. Because they say, look, I've done all that I can do to raise up my child. I bring them to church, making them read his Bible, praying, praying for him. I'm trying all that I can, Proverbs 22, to fulfill this verse here. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I mean, you'd like to believe that is, is with all your heart. I'm going to do the best I can to raise up my kid to, in, the, in the ways of the Lord. Show him about judgment, truth, and righteousness, and holiness, and forsaking the, the things of the world. I'm going to try to train him up the way he goes, and best off, you know, he, he shouldn't depart from it. Sometimes they do. Solomon wrote that proverb. And you look at his son Rehoboam, what happened to Rehoboam? Guy conspired, he wanted, to, he wanted to get the throne, wanted to get Solomon off. Rehoboam, you read, I believe, in, he was one of them judges or kings or whatever that said, he, you know, this king did wicked in the sight of the Lord, this king did good in the sight of the Lord. He was one of them kings, this king did wicked in the sight of the Lord. So that, uh, that was Solomon. You'd think of a wise, the wisest man on earth could train up a child that wouldn't depart from the Lord. Rehoboam, he, uh, he, de he departed from the Lord, man. So, uh, you know, when you have a wayward son or a wayward daughter, you've got to remember the one who wrote that had one too. He had a wayward son. Prodigal, or, uh, well, yeah, prodigal son or whatever that would be Rehoboam. And um, 
So that, that shows you that, you know, that, that probably Rehoboam picked up some of the practices that his father, Solomon, did in all his dark times and dark ages. And he said, I'm going to do the same things. And that guy never got right. Praise God, Solomon got right. Now, New Testament. We're going to be done. New Testament. Not to kind of go through this one kind of quick too here. New Testament. Hmm. I mean, I probably should stop it. Um, yeah, I probably should just stop it actually. Because I want to talk in the New Testament. I'm probably spend a little, we'll spend next week on it. We'll spend next next week on Jesus and his brethren, and we'll spend some time on uh, on the Apostle Paul, and we'll talk about family in the New Testament. So that's where we're going to stop here for this evening. We'll cut it on uh, all those family troubles, dysfunctional families in the Old Testament, and we'll get to the application of this thing next week here. All right. So let's just bow our heads here for closing prayer. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we just we just want to ask your Lord for um, just a special anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit upon the families, Lord. And uh, Lord, we um, after reading all these 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 stories about dysfunctional families in the Bible, Lord, we, we may believe that we came from one, or that we're that we're in one, Lord. And when we really think of it, we're not, Lord. We we have parents. I uh, I had parents, Lord. I mean, they might have been broken up and all, but I know they loved me. Uh, you know, Lord, at least I had a mom and dad, and at least I didn't have two dads or two moms or something, Lord. So um, I'm grateful for a lot of things, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you, um, you just restore fellowship with everyone in the family. That you, uh, that you, the devil, he's trying to tear apart families, Lord, in, in this world and, and just wreck it. He's been throughout, throughout every single family in this Bible we can see that he's been trying to creep into families. Pray, Lord, that we stand strong and, uh, Troubles and, and bitterness and envy and jealousies, they're bound to come with families and siblings. But I pray that they don't take hold of the individual. I pray that they repent, get things right, uh, just, um, just, just get back in fellowship one with another and, and forgiving one another for Christ's sake, Lord, because you forgave us from a lot of things. And I pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord. Help us apply these things to our hearts and with our daily walk with you, Lord. And We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty. Um, Julie, you want to...